All right. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to session 11 of the Mythgard Academy's uh, uh, discussion of uh, Sir Thomas Mallory's The Mort d'Arthur. Uh, I've been really looking forward to this one for a while. Uh, you know, I said that the last section, the Emperor Lucius section, is my least favorite part uh, of uh, Sir Thomas Mallory's works. The Tale of Sir Lancelot is one of my favorite <laughs> parts of Maori's work. So we get this immediate payback for having made it through uh, the Emperor Lucius section. Um, and um, uh, yeah, <laughs> James is laughing at my... the. So I set Twitch, you know, tw uh, when I start the broadcast on Twitch, it sends a notification thing. Um, so I, I forgot exactly how I what I put, but it was something about, uh, 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 cosplay and necrophilia and everything. Uh, and actually James, the funny thing is when I first typed that into Twitch, it wouldn't let me put it because it was like, this violates our, mo our, mo our moderation standards. And I'm like, oops. <laughs> so I changed it to necrophiliac instead of necrophilia. And that did the trick that passed. <laughs> I was like, oh man, that's not good. But anyway, um, <laughs> yeah so uh okay yeah i don't see sharon i mean what could be what could be more family friendly in fact sharon i was thinking of you because i think i tagged uh uh fun for the whole family at, uh, at the end of it yeah <laughs> anyway it's all good um uh it's, this is I, I, come on this section is so much fun so lancelot's life uh, he gets so he, he gets a much better life than Sir Balin, you have to say. Like, you know, he's a better knight than Sir Balin was, but still. Um, uh, <laughs> anyway. So I wanted to start off with an important announcement, as you can see. And of course, as I mentioned last week, uh, our fundraising campaign has begun. It is time for the Signum University annual fundraising campaign, uh, where we uh, work as we have been working now for the last, uh, this is our sixth annual fundraising campaign to keep the doors of Signum University open and to keep access to all of this uh, awesome free stuff that you guys have been enjoying uh, for at least a little while, if not for many years. Um, uh, open and available and uh, uh, not only continuing, but actually increasing. I'm looking forward to sharing with you some um, some really fun uh, things that we're going to be uh, looking to expand and, and, and do that are new uh, in the in the coming year. Uh, we're going to do some announcements about that a little bit later on. I'm not going to do big announcements tonight, but I did want to remind you about the fundraising campaign um, because uh, this is uh, this is a really exciting time of year. Um, uh, you know, it's it's the, the one time of the year when, you know, we ask you to consider giving back uh, if you've been enjoying the, the stuff that we put out there. Uh, for, uh, if you want to support Signum University, if you appreciate our vision and what we're trying to accomplish in higher education. And, you know, we've already accomplished so much thanks to you guys. Uh, you know, I was saying this last night in my Exploring the Lord of the Rings class, but, you know, I could tell as I was going through that process, the, uh, the review process in the state of New Hampshire um, last month, it was very clear, you know, as I'm sitting in a room with like, you know, the other uh, university presidents of different universities in the state of New Hampshire. And it's clear that they kind of don't know what to make of us. Right. We're we're so different, not just in our vision and not just in how we operate, but the mere fact that we have. I don't know. It's like we we're, we're, we're not affiliated with any other institution, but we also don't have money. Like we didn't start up with a big endowment. Um, it's like, how did, how did, how did that happen? You know, I, I, you shouldn't exist, right? It shouldn't be possible uh, to begin a university and sustain the growth of a university by crowdfunding it. Right. Um, but we have, you know, and that's been thanks to you, um, you know, to everyone who has donated, um, donated their money, donated their time uh, in volunteering. Um, we have uh, accomplished really wonderful things over the first seven years of Signum University. And this year is a, a really exciting step. This year is, uh, you know, we're really on the threshold, you know, it, on the doorstep is our, uh, um, our, 
uh, uh, slogan, our sort of motto for the fundraising campaign this year. And, you know, it's sort of in two senses, right? On the one hand, uh, it's because Signum itself is sort of on the doorstep of of, uh, of something big. I can't help but think of uh, Bilbo sitting on the doorstep and thinking uh, at the Lonely Mountain. I'm not saying that the doorstep we are at the, uh, uh, we're, uh, the, the door that we are on the doorstep of is, uh, is, is a dragon's cave, necessarily. Um, but... Um, Anyway, uh, we, um, uh, but of course, it's also, you know, uh, being on the doorstep, uh, you know, the way in which we, you know, invite people to sort of, uh, uh, you know, unlock new wor- worlds of learning, you know, to be able to come through and, uh, and sort of to provide the opportunity for people to discover things that they never knew and uh, uh, to explore these worlds that they love. This has been, it's been so rewarding over many years. Uh, and we just, uh, want to show our gratitude back to you guys as well. Um, so, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, exactly. As, you know, Krita says, you know, we are, in all humility, we are the university of the future. That's it. That's what we're trying to, that's what we're trying to do, actually. We're trying to, uh, we're trying to show that, you don't have to do higher education the old way. You know, there are lots of things that we can, we can do things differently now. There are a lot of the, the, the ways in which the old system is kind of broken. I mean, I don't think that's news to anybody. Um, and that we can, we can do things differently and we're trying to show how that's possible. And so it's kind of fitting that we're doing that in a different way, right? Not by the normal channels. Uh, and in, again, all of you guys, uh, you know, if you're able to, to make a donation to help to support us, however small, um, you're, part of that right and you've been a part of that all the way along um so uh anyway that's that's been you know i, I really so I, as i said i really appreciate all of your uh your donations and support um and uh and again and it's time again for me to ask you to consider supporting us again or more you know many of you have set up monthly donations uh from last year you know which of course uh, if you just like to to continue those that'd be awesome or or, or consider uh maybe a small increase of those we would uh you know th- those are super valuable to us um wanted to remind you of the uh, of our um this, so this, by the way, of course, is our uh, our annual fund page, signumuniversity.org slash fund, um, where you can find all this stuff. You can find us on the on the on the donate tab here uh, when you go to our website on the annual fund page. Um, uh, there's lots of things here, but the, I wanted to draw your attention to we we have a do, our donor rewards program. So just you know, because we like to show our gratitude back to you uh, when you are uh, generous and donating to us. Um, and of course, many of you have been around for a long time and know this, but there are a couple new things that I wanted to draw your attention to this year. Um, so first, the old uh, standbys, you know, what, what has been a feature of this fundraising campaign since we first ran it in 2013 uh, is voting rights for the Mythgard Academy. What we're doing right now was literally born in our first fundraising campaign when I said, hey, wouldn't it be fun uh, to you know, do a, a series of seminars that we just sort of throw open to the people who support us and let them vote to do what books that we do. And we've been doing that now for, uh, we've been, we've, we've just, just completed now five years of, uh, uh, of running that. So of course you get voting rights, uh, for, uh, for every dollar that you donate, you get a vote, uh, to determine what book we talk about next in the Mythgard Academy. And if you donate a hundred dollars for the year or just $10 a month, uh, then you will get membership on the Council of the Wise, which is the nominating committee. So you, that, that's when you get to nominate a book. Um, everybody who, who, who gives gets to vote, uh, but everybody who is on the Council of the Wise gets to be part of the nominating discussion to nominate the slate of finalists. And then, uh, um, and then the, the slate of finalists goes to, goes to everybody. Um, so, um, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Curtis says, assuming we get to actually nominate a new book for 2019. No, we will. We will. We're, we're, uh, we're gonna, we're gonna be, th- okay. We probably won't be through Mallory by Christmas, but it, it's, it, we're not going to take the whole year doing Sir Thomas Mallory. I'm sure. I'm sure we're not going to take the whole year doing it. Um, anyway, no, it, it's going to be good. So plus anyway, like I said, there's more stuff, right? Um, we're going to be, we're, we, we have some fun expansion plans that I mentioned that we're going to talk about later on in the campaign. Um, 
so a, a couple other things, though, that I wanted to draw your attention to. Uh, one small thing and one big thing. The small thing is, uh, you may remember last year we introduced, uh, if you give $150 a year, that's just $12 a month, um, you will get uh, your choice of one of our two items of our Signum Annual Memorabilia, uh, a mug or a bag. So our mug is, so we have our, our, our mug here with our with our Signum uh, 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 logo and graphic. It's a really cool mug. Or you can have a bag. Oh, I just smacked myself in the face. You can have a bag, a uh, you know, one of these um, eco-conscious shopping bags and stuff are useful. Uh, uh, this, so we had those last year. We have a new set this year. Uh, it's pretty cool. And But the new thing that I wanted to emphasize is uh, at $200 and up. So I'm starting a new thing this year. Um, everybody who donates $200 or $15 a month uh, will be uh, will become a member of, of what I'm calling the Signum Fellowship. And what we're going to do with the Signum Fellowship, every month I'm going to have a meeting, um, just like an hour maybe, um, in which I get together with the Signum Fellowship. You know, you'll, you'll be invited to the meeting. It'll be on GoToWebinar like the Mythgard Academy classes are. Um, and uh, I'm just going to, I'm going to, I'm going to update you as to what's going on to let you know, you know, what's kind of going on behind the scenes at Signum. What are we planning what's coming up um and uh, also kind of sometimes maybe run some things by you get some feedback or advice from you guys you know just kind of want to keep you in the loop about what's going on because it's hard for me often to f i wish that i had more time to do things like write an awesome newsletter to everybody you know uh i don't know monthly i, I don't have time for that so but i do, i could carve out time to do a meeting that would be fun um so that's what we're going to do. So it's, it's going to be, uh, you know, we can, you know, we can chat and I can answer questions and uh, it's going to be really cool. So uh, so the Signum Fellowship, if you can't attend the meeting live, we'll send you a link to a recording of it, of course. Um, but that meeting is just going to be uh, for the members of the Signum Fellowship. Uh, so, again, if your donation is two hundred dollars or more uh, and uh, you or again, you just all, all you need to give is fifteen dollars a month. And, which is like what, like one movie ticket these days. Uh, and anyway, then you'll uh, uh, then you'll be able to be in the Signum Fellowship. Um, a lot of the rest of them, I, I, I will sort of commend the rest of the list to your um, uh, to your uh, perusal here. And a lot of it is, is similar to last year, if you are familiar with uh, with that. So I just wanted to draw your attention to that and how that works. But also I wanted to um, uh tell you that I wanted to do a couple uh, drawings here tonight. We're going to do a couple special things um, in just in kind of celebration of the Mythgard Academy and uh, your participation here. Um, we're going to do a couple things. So one thing we're going to do is we're going to do a drawing for everybody who don't. So if you if you make a donation or if you have already made a donation or if you're going to continue a recurring donation, send us an email at the email address down here on my little red square here, donate at signumu.org. Uh, and you can sort of choose to, uh, to, to, to mention one of our programs. So, if, so in this case, if you want to mention the Mythgard Academy, you can uh, send us an email uh, mentioning the Mythgard Academy and we will count your donation towards uh, a, a drawing that we're going to do during our, our webathon. So our campaign ending webathon is going to be on October 13th two weeks from Saturday. Uh, and uh, during that time, we'll, we'll, we'll do our drawing uh, and uh, give away prizes uh, to three uh, of our donors who have sent us an email and uh, mentioned the Mythgard Academy. Um, and the prize, the prize is for those. So um, the, um, the, 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 the prizes we're going to give away, all three of our drawing winners uh, from, our, from our, our, our donor drawing, um, we'll get uh, one of our anytime audit uh, classes, uh, a, a, an anytime audit seat in one of our courses from our Signum course catalog, um, any of our courses in the course catalog, you can pick. Um, and so if you don't know what our, about our anytime audit program, this is all of the courses uh, that we have uh, in our catalog there, you can get access to after the fact. So you can get asynchronous access to the entire course. You get access to all the lectures. You get access to all the course materials and handouts and everything like that. Um, so you can just basically kind of go through the course materials at your own uh, at your own speed. Um, we've got a, a lot of really awesome courses uh, in our archives there, in our catalog. Um, so we're going to give... And the, the normal tuition rate for our Anytime Audit uh, courses is uh, only, only $95 uh, a piece. But we're going to give away three of them uh, to the people who win the drawings 
um, in our uh, in our Mythgard Academy drawing. But the grand prize winner, going to have one grand prize winner who's going to get one of those and also a special Mythgard Academy uh, gift. And that special Mythgard Academy gift is going to be at our next election, you will get to unilaterally nominate a, a book, right? So you'll be able to add something to the nomination slate. So the Council of the Wise will deliberate and, uh, and, uh, and you know, elect the finalist slate. And you will get the right just to add one, uh, an additional book of your own independent choice to the finalist slate for everybody to vote on uh, afterwards. Um, so that's that. That in addition to the anytime audit is the is the grand prize uh, for the Mythgard Academy drawing. So keep in mind that's you've got what two and a half weeks basically. Um, so if you if you again if you have made a donation if you make a donation this evening if you make a donation sometime in the next two and a half weeks. And then send us an email to donate at signumu.org. Mention the Mythgard Academy, and we will enter you in that drawing. That means, of course, if you're listening to this recording after the fact, uh, and it's still before October 13th, 2018, then you can uh, go ahead and uh, uh, and send us uh, uh, send us an email, and we'll include you in that drawing. You don't have to attend live uh, to qualify for this. Um, and by the way, if you're listening after October. Uh, 13th, 2018. Uh, please do feel free to donate anyway. That's a really an evergreen message, I gotta say. We, we, we accept and appreciate your donations whenever they come in. So to all of you who are listening to this recording in the year 2021, I promise you we still need your support. So, um, uh, so no worries about that. Um, <laughs> See, exactly. Three people mentioned Twilight, you know, when I talk about the nomination. Bring it, man. I'm ready. I'm so ready to talk about Twilight. Uh, yeah. Um, so, uh, and so this is the donate link right here. So signumuniversity.org slash donate. Um, or if you go going back to the web page here, uh, you, you go to uh, donate and just click the donate now button and that will take you to the donate form here as well. So there you go. Very simple. Um, uh, and so, okay, so I I said we're going to do this. So this is sort of the big drawing, right, with the Anytime Audits as prizes uh, for everybody who donates and then sends us an email uh, mentioning uh, they, the uh, Mythgard Academy. But I also want to do a drawing just to kind of celebrate the... Um, uh, the people who are here, the people who show up and make this class really fun uh, and interactive and, uh, in, in, in the live session. Uh, so just to, to sort of celebrate the fundraising campaign and to celebrate you back uh, as we're celebrating the Mythgard Academy, um, I, I'm going to do a drawing tonight and each of the next three weeks. So, you know, the, during the during the course of the campaign, we're going to do we're going to do drawing every night. Um, just an attendee drawing to uh, of those of you who are here live Um and we will, um, uh, we will, uh, we're, we're going to give you a prize. And the prize we're going to do, we're going to give you, we're going to, we're going to give you a book. So we're going to, we're going to, we're going to do uh, a book, several of which we've already done in the Mythgard Academy. Um, one of which is next in the Mythgard Academy. So you can pick your favorite title of these five books. My book uh, on The Hobbit, um, Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, Unfinished Tales, which is one of the first uh, 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 Mythgard Academy books we did way back in 2014, I believe. Uh, that was a super fun, still one of my like all time uh, favorite Mythgard Academy uh, discussions that we did. Uh, Sauron Defeated, which is a of course, what is coming next after uh, uh, Mallory and Dune, which was another really fun Mythgard Academy class. Uh, so you can choose one of those, um, uh, one of those, um, uh, one of those five, and uh, we'll send you a free copy of the book, and we'll also send you a customized book plate that I've written up uh, with my signature, so uh, you, which you can put in the front of the book, so your little commemorative Mythgard Academy uh, free book uh, that we will have for you. So, um, so I'm going to do drawings. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask somebody <laughs> to remind me to do this in the middle of class. I don't do it right now at the beginning. Actually, okay, maybe I will do it at the beginning. Why not? I think we got a bunch of people here. Um, and it's what it's yeah it's ten thirty. I think everyone who's gonna come is probably here. Um, so we'll we'll actually do do. Nah, no, I'll do them later. I'll do them later. Uh, in fact, I'm gonna do them at the end. At, ooh, at the end of class, that's hardcore, right? Because it's gonna be late when we end. Um, uh, no, but I do want to do them at the end of class because I'm gonna do two drawings. So I'm gonna do. Uh, I'm gonna do one drawing among everybody who's here. 
uh, and then actually, yeah, yeah, I'm going to do one drawing among, among everybody who's here, and I'm going to do another drawing uh, for people who have made a donation during class tonight. So uh, if you want to you wanna double or actually quite a bit more than double uh, your chances of winning one of our prizes, make a donation during the course of class tonight, and you will get entered into our second drawing and have a, um, have a, a greater chance of, uh, of winning a free book. So, okay. Um, yeah, yeah. Cool. Um, <laughs> Sarah Gretz says, wait, Sauron gets defeated? I know, right? I mean, like, putting a spoiler in the title of a book, that's kind of crazy. Oh, Carrie, uh, Unfinished Tales is your first, uh, uh, your first Mythgard experience? That's cool. Um, yeah, awesome. Awesome. Um, yeah, that was so much fun. I, I, I still... Uh, sort of go back to that, go back to that class. Um, yeah, cool. Megan, great question. If you watch more than one of the programs, um, you should choose one. Uh, we, we, yeah, yeah. We, we, we're not going to, uh, uh, we don't want people to be double dipping in multiple uh, drawings. Um, uh, but we do, we do, we do. Yeah. So we encourage you to choose your, uh, cho choose your favorite and, uh, and mention that one uh, in the email. Um yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Cool, cool. All right, um, good. Yeah, David, you're right. The Return of the King is kind of a spoiler too, isn't it? But I, of course, by that time, it shouldn't exactly be a surprise, or you know, it's not exactly spoiling anything that Aragorn's going to return. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, oh, really? Mithalia, uh Unfinished Tales is your first non-Lord of the Rings Tolkien work. Cool, cool. Um, yeah, neat. All right. Um, cool. So with that, um, <laughs> with <the laughs> Pumple's asking about the novelization of the Dune movie. No, 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 actually, no. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, cool. <laughs> All right, uh, so we'll come back and we'll do the drawings uh, at or near the end of class. I'll, Lynn, I'll try not to wait too late. And I don't want to make everybody wait up until, you know, one o'clock in the morning Eastern time. Um, but, um, but yeah, cool. All right, so let us get back to Mallory then. I'm going to leave, as you see, I'm going to leave uh, in my slides uh, the both the email address and the donation link there uh, for your convenience. Uh, okay, Um Sir Lancelot is the knight that Sir Thomas Mallory has been waiting for. I've mentioned before, right, that Sir Lancelot is, he is his paragon, right? He is uh, the greatest of all time. The, uh, you know, Sir Lancelot is going to be eclipsed technically, right? Sir Galahad technically is going to surpass uh, Sir Lancelot, um, but only in a kind of technical sense, because Sir Galahad is only around for like five minutes, right? So, um, whereas Lancelot is really, uh, is really, he's the guy, right? Um, and one of the things that I think is so interesting about uh, the book of Sir Lancelot here in the middle of this short, awesome, super fun little book, and David, I agree with a comment you made a while back, um, that uh, I, this book is exactly the kind of thing you expect, right? You know, if you uh, if you had any sort of expectations of what uh, you know a book about the adventures of a knight of the round table is like, this is this is probably more like the kind of thing that you were expecting, right? That that I can definitely that I can definitely see. Um, and anyway, it's 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 interesting that. Um, that he, that Mallory, has chosen Sir Lancelot. I've mentioned before that Sir Gawain is the traditional choice, right? Sir Gawain has been the, you know, sort of representative paragon uh, of knightly virtue for centuries, really. Um, he, that is, Mallory, is not inventing Lancelot by any means, um, but he is the one who is really deciding Sir Lancelot is going to be the guy, right? Um, and he's kind of aggressive, as I've mentioned, in taking Sir Gawain down a few pegs to make sure there's no real competition there. Um, uh, so I mentioned before, um, 
you know, we've talked at, at various points so far in trying to establish some concepts from within the text, right? Some standards from within the text about moral judgments and things, you know, like if we're disapproving of something, how do we know we're supposed to disapprove of it? And, uh, and all that, you know, it's not just enough to say, well, you know, that's a sin according to the church. And so therefore that's probably bad, right? I mean, you know, often that is the case, but we can't necessarily safely assume that as I've explained. So, uh, what do we do? Well, Here's a really good place, right? This book in particular establishes... I'm not saying that everything Lancelot does is absolutely perfect, but it's kind of close. He, uh, he, he um, acquits himself very well during this, uh, during this section uh, in several kind of challenging circumstances. Uh, so you can see one of the ways in which I think you, we can kind of understand what's going on in this book, um, uh, that is the, the, the book of Sir Lancelot, is it's almost like a case study, right? As as Mallory puts Lancelot in like one different scenario after another, often kind of similar scenarios that he kind of tweaks a little bit. And then, you know, like, what does Lancelot do here? Well, how does he confront this? You know, how does he overcome this particular challenge? It's not just about, um, it's not just about uh, Lancelot, um, being awesome, like showing that he is the best knight in the world. It's about that too, establishing his credentials as the greatest of all time. But it's also um, really sort of showing him as the exemplar of knightly virtue. And in that regard, we learn some pretty darn ins- uh, interesting things um, about the uh, uh, the rest of the text. Now, uh, great question, James, is Lancelot du Lac related to the Lady of the Lake? Like, what is his connection with lakes? I am not sure. I assume when whenever somebody is from a, you know, mountain or a hill or a forest or a lake, um, I always, I, 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 this, I believe that's just like sort of where, like geographically, like where their hometown is, right? Um, and if you'll notice that whole clan, so Lancelot is one of four, French knights. Uh, so Ban and Bors had each of them two kids, right? So Lancelot, Bors, Lionel, and Hector uh, are all four of them. Like they are the four sons of Ban and Bors. And I always get it mixed up. I think it's Hector who is actually Lancelot's full brother, and Bors and Lionel are his cousins. I think, um, but I always get it confused with between Lionel and Hector, which I know Bors is his cousin uh, because you know Sir Bors is. This will shock you. The son of King Bors, right? Uh, whereas Lancelot is the son of King Ban. Um, and I, but I, I always forget which one, whether it's Hector or Lionel. I think it's Hector who is Lancelot's brother. If I'm not making a mistake about that. Um, but um, uh, anyway, so. Uh, but the reason it's confusing, the reason I find it hard to keep that straight, is they are, the four of them are are as tight as if they're all full brothers. I mean, they 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 even call each. He will call all of them. Lancelot will call all three of them his brother. He doesn't mean that literally. Only one of them is his full sibling, um, and the other two are his cousins German. But still, um, he uh, he 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 talks about them and thinks about them um, as um, as uh, as as brothers. Um, anyway, all of them you'll notice um, uh, James are connected with water, like. Uh, Damaris is uh, is what like Bors, uh, Sir Bors Damaris, uh, Sir Hector Damaris, um, which means of the sea, right? So I again like there's some. I think they just come from near a body of water. I don't think it's connected. I don't think he's related to the Lady of the Lake. At least we don't ever learn anything about that. I mean, he's the son of King Ban, and that's what is um, emphasized about him all the way through. Um, yeah, Matt, it is confusing with Hector, uh, Sir, Hector uh, Sir Hector or Sir Hector with an H, as he's sometimes called. Um, it is confusing. It's not the same guy who is uh, King Arthur's foster father. Uh, totally unrelated knight of the same name. So, yeah, it is a little bit a little bit confusing. Um, uh, but David, absolutely. It is a deliberate callback uh, to uh, uh, to Hector of Troy. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um yeah, Carrie, there are lakes all over the place, some of which are 
fairy lakes in some of which I guess not every lake is a fairy lake I guess I think I'm not really sure um, but yes Karita that's exactly correct Lancelot like Mary Poppins is practically perfect in every way so there there you go uh, there's your what do Lancelot and Mary Poppins have in common um, uh, <laughs> point for tonight I'm sure there are more similarities but uh, but yes that's exactly right. not absolutely perfect um, but practically perfect. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, so here's here's our introduction to Lancelot. Now remember, we we we've been introduced to him in the in the Emperor Lucia section, right? That was his first foray. He had just been knighted, and very soon after he's knighted, he goes on uh, on the Roman campaign with Arthur and distinguishes himself very greatly in battle, as we learned last time. Um, but of course, this is when they come home from the Roman adventure. Many of them distinguish themselves very greatly in adventures, and then we're told, but in especial, it was praved on Sir Launcelot du Lac, for in all tournaments, justice, and deeds of armies, both for life and death, he passed all other connectors, and at no time was he overcome, but if it were by treason, other enchantment. So this Sir Launcelot increased so marvellously in worship and honour, therefore he is the fierst knight that the French book maketh mention of, after King Arthur come from Rome. Wherefore, Queen Guinevere had him in great favour, above all other knights, and so he loved the queen again, above it all other laddies, dies of his leaf, and so for here he did many deeds of armies, and saved here from the, f from the fire, through his noble chivalry. Savid her from the fire. Now that's important, right? Um, that's important because that is a piece of foreshadowing there, right? In fact, that's more than foreshadowing. That is practically a Merlin-like spoiler. Um, Merlin probably you know, wrote that with his gold sharpie somewhere uh, around England, right? And we just haven't come across it yet. Um, because um, uh, yeah, so um, uh Oh, yeah, the fire. Right. Uh, remember, the fire has come up before Sir Balin's mom got burned at the stake. Uh, and I mentioned that's how noble ladies are executed. Right. When noble ladies are convicted of capital crimes, they're they're burned and they're not decapitated. They're burned. Um, uh, you can be uh, you, you can be beheaded if you're. Uh, if you're a dude, right? But if you're a lady, you get burned. Um, so the implication here, not the implication, um, what we're being told, what is being, what is being uh, alluded to here is the fact that the day is going to come when Guinevere is going to be convicted of a capital offense. Guess which one? And she is going to uh, be, and Lancelot's going to save her from the stake, right? She's going to be saved from the fire. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, OK. Um, yeah. No, David, burning is not reserved as a punishment for heresy. Uh, it's popularized as a punishment for heresy later on. But we're not. Um, yeah, that's uh, that's 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 later on. It's uh, it's very clear from references that uh, several characters make that it's the standard uh, execution form uh, for women. Um, yeah. Yeah. Stephen and Karita are pointing out that um, uh um, if you're a lady, you get a far more painful death. Yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah. 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 Mm hmm. I get that. Yeah. That's it's true. Uh, totally unfair. Um, I don't know the rationale, actually, as to why burning at the stake is more appropriate. But there it is. Um, uh, Sarah Grant asks, uh, is this assuming, therefore, that uh, readers already know the Lancelot Guinevere story? Yeah, that's why there are spoilers all the way through. He's he's he is not going to surprise anyone with anything. Well, OK, the necrophiliac sorceress might take some people by surprise. But as far as big picture events are concerned, he's not he's not surprising anybody. I mean, this is all established stuff. Um, and so in particular, Lancelot's relationship with Guinevere and the uh, the 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 causal relationship between Lancelot and Guinevere's relationship and the downfall of the Arthurian court is established. That's known. That's a that. In fact, it is that context in which Lancelot as a character was first invented. I mentioned this briefly before, but Sir Lancelot uh, first 
is invented by Chrétien de Troyes in his romance called uh, The Knight of the Cart, Le Chevalier de Charette. Uh, it's a French romance. Um, uh, uh, and uh, it's the it's so it's it, that is the the first time we ever see the knight called Sir Lancelot, and he is presented as a paragon and exemplar, but he's not a paragon of knightly virtue, generally speaking. He is the paragon of courtly love, right? He is the ultimate lover, and he is the lover of Guinevere because uh, she is the ultimate love object, right? I mean, in in my little little spoiler of my reading of Chrétien de Troyes, part anyway of my reading of Chrétien de Troyes' uh, Night of the Cart, um, he's he tells courtly love stories. Uh, a bunch, you know, many of his chivalric romances, Chrétien's, are uh, you know courtly love stories. In the Night of the Cart, he is sort of taking the conventions of courtly love and he takes them to their logical extreme. Right. Let's embody all of the most extreme. Like, so it's take all the things that we say make a good courtly lover and let's, you know, put them all to the maximum. Right. Let's 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 set the sliders on full uh, for every dimension of a courtly lover. Right. And let's see how that works out. Let's show what that actually looks like. Right. What would the perfect, the most extreme courtly lover look like. But of course, the most extreme courtly lover has to have the most extreme beloved, right? Um, if he's the paragon of courtly love, then he would merit the highest lady in the land, who's Queen Guinevere, right? Um, and so he becomes the lover. He is, he's designed, right, um, to be, um, uh, to be the, the, uh, the lover of Guinevere. Um, that's his initial concept. So anyway, um, that's, uh, it's part of the initial concept of his character. So to take that and to say, no, 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 I'm not just going to make him this almost something like a parody is kind of what Cratian's Lancelot ends up being right. Uh, in his first one, because again, he's just sort of like, uh, you know, if we put it all to the extremes, he's really weird. Right. Uh, and he does, uh, some really. <laughs> Some really strange things uh, uh, in the poem. However, um, Mallory says, no, no, no. I'm going to take that and I'm going to make him uh, the overall knightly paragon. And um, so, by the way, the French book, he's referred to the French book many times before already. And he's going to refer to the French book many times again. Uh, he refers to the French book as his primary source, uh, his source text. Um, he claims to be just translating the French book into English, which of course he's not just translating the French book into English. Uh, the French books that he's referring to, um, are what are called the Vulgate cycle, uh, which was a series of, uh, 14th century French, uh, prose, versions, uh, quite long, um, uh, quite hard to get actually nowadays. Um, but anyway, um, uh, long versions of the, of these, of these romances, but they're, they're like his role model, right? I want to do the long prose authoritative English version of, uh, uh, of the, the Arthur stories. Um, so when he refers to the French book, it's actually not Crétin de Troyes that he's referring to. Um, he's referring to the later prose adaptation of these stories, which kind of take the story in a slightly different direction. Anyway, um, and they build on Cratian's Lancelot and they, 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 they give Lancelot an important role. Um, and yet, Julie, you're absolutely right that, of course, Mordred uh, was in was very much involved uh, in the uh, uh, the breaking of the round table. And Merlin foretells that that's going to be not the breaking of the round table exactly, but the the, the breaking of the downfall of Arthur personally. Right. Um, so you can see Maori balancing these two things. I mentioned at the end of class last time that the alliterative Mort Arthur, which was his source that he was uh, fairly closely adapting uh, in the Emperor Lucius section, ends with Arthur being recalled to go back home because Guinevere has eloped with Mordred uh, and the two of them have seized his throne. And then he comes back and he fights with Mordred and dies. Arthur does. Uh, Guinevere escapes with her unprecedented children, as I mentioned um, in that poem. Um, so, the you know the the um, 
incorporation of Lancelot into that. That, that was the alliterative Mord Arthur was ignoring Lancelot on purpose, basically, as the love interest and in, in, uh, 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 bringing Mordred in. Anyway, there are lots of different versions out there, um, but um, there's nowhere, I don't think, there are relatively few places where he's completely inventing big parts of the story. Um Again, small details, yes, but uh, uh, and sometimes changing some of the characterizations substantially. Um, but here's one of the issues. What is this paragraph saying about his relationship with Guinevere? Let me be blunt. Is Lancelot sleeping with Guinevere? Are we safe to assume that? I mean, I've said before that courtly love is all about, like, trying to, you know get your lady into bed with you. It's not a, it's not a, a platonic kind of thing. Um, so we're told Queen Guinevere had him in great favor above and all other connectors. And so he loved the queen again above all other laddies dies of his life. Um, are we to assume they're an item that like she's cheating on Arthur with Lancelot? Is that what's happening here? Um, a lot of people, a lot of people who read this, make that assumption. Um, I am prepared to argue very strongly that that is not the case. We have to be very careful uh, in the assumptions that we make um, uh, when we read the text, uh, because I think it's fairly clear. Look at this other, this other passage from a little bit later, uh, which is highly relevant uh, to the status of his relationship with Queen Guinevere. Uh, this is the damsel that he goes around with for a while, uh, like doing the, what he meets her and says, Hey, uh, do you know of any adventures around here? And she's like, actually, yeah. And she's the one who leads him to Sir Tarquin and, uh, and then leads him to the, uh, to the, to the damsel attacking knight and serves as bait. Right. And uh, anyway, so, you know, it's, she's like his damsel who's like guiding him on adventures, kind of like the damsels, you know, who guided, um, Gawain and Uwain and Marholt before. And um, he's he's ready to say goodbye, right? I mean, they've 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 done a bunch of adventures and, and now Lancelot's gonna go his separate ways from her. Um, and he says, Now, damsel, sighed Sir Lancelot, will ye any more service of me? Nice here, she sighed, at this time. But Almighty Jesu preserve you wheresomever ye ride or go, for the curtes knicked thou art. And myth, and uh, uh, and meekest unto all ladies and gentlewomen that now liveth, but own thing, sir knecht, me think is ye lack, ye that are a knecht wiveless, that ye will not love some maiden, other gentlewoman, for I could never hear say that ever ye loved any of no manner of degree, and that is great. Uh, uh, well, sorry, I wonder if, if uh, that's quite right. This is great. Hmm. Can somebody check that text for me? I think I'm missing something here. Um, I overlooked that before. Um, yeah. Or maybe I skipped a line. Not sure, um, but I know she's. But I remember that she says that um, she's heard that Guinevere has ordained by enchantment that ye shall never love none other but here, neither or none other damsel, ne laddie shall rejoice you. Wherefore there be many in this land of high estate and low that mock great sorrow. Okay. Uh, and that is great pity. Yeah, I think I missed a line. I think I, 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 I think I, let me, let me, let me see if I can find this here. Hang on a second. I, this is important. Uh, hang on one second here. Where are we on? We're on page 160. Okay. Um, yes. And that is great pity, but it is noised that ye love Queen Guinevere and that she hath ordained by enchantment. Yeah, I skipped a line. Um, yeah, that is great pity, and it is noised that uh, that uh, ye love Guinevere and that she hath ordained. Okay, right, great. Excellent. Yeah, thank you, David. You just, uh, right, after, right as I found it, uh, you put it in for me. Okay, cool. All right. So, 
let's pause there for a second before we get to Lancelot's response. Notice what she's like, okay, you are almost the perfect knight, Lancelot, but you fail of perfection in one way. You're not a lover, right? You should have a lover. You should have a beloved. All good knights have a beloved, man. What's wrong with you? Right? And, 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 and what's more, I mean, he is the most worthy dude in there. I mean, he is the top of the courtly love food chain, right? Every lady in the land would want to be his beloved, which we see all the time, right? You know, Sir Lancelot pro hashtag Sir Lancelot problems, right? Everywhere he goes, ladies are like, would you please kiss me, right? Uh, you have to choose one of us to be your lover, right? I mean, it's everybody wants him, right? Now, does this mean that Sir Lancelot is irresistibly uh, hot, you know, uh, no, not necessarily. I mean, he might be perfectly, attra uh, you know, attractive, but it's not about that. It's not about his uh, his physical person. It's about his reputation, um, because that's what primarily matters for adventurous knights. Um, uh, that's how you work your way up the, the, the food chain. And we've already talked about this, right? There's the there's the knightly rankings and there's the courtly love rankings. And they're kind of similar, uh, they're, they're definitely correlated. Um, so, um, uh, yeah. So anyway, he, um, he is imperfect because he's not a lover, except he is a lover, right? Um, she says, you know, it's, it's, it's noised that you love Guinevere, right? Um, and that she, by enchantment, uh, and that she has ordained by enchantment that you shall never love none other but her, right? So notice there's criticism of Guinevere. He's not blamed. Well, no, he is being blamed, right? Um, like, Guinevere's kind of off limits, seems to be the implication. I mean, because notice she's saying two things at once. She's saying, why don't you take... A, you know, why don't you have a beloved that's not right? And then she's like, and, but it's rumored that Guinevere is your beloved. Well, okay, that seems like a contradiction, right? So therefore, she seems to be suggesting the only beloved that you seem to be taking is like the one, obviously, that you can't have, right? That's, that's right out. Why is that right out? Why should that be right out? In the old days, by which I mean Chrétien de Troyes, right? By which I mean 12th century, in 12th century France, the queen, the wife of the king, not only is she not off limits, she is the paragon of beloveds, right? She was, in Chrétien's poem, the natural, the inevitable beloved of the ultimate courtly lover, right? If he is the ultimate courtly lover, by definition, it's the queen that he's going to love, the highest lady in the land. Um, so, I. Uh, But she's implying that that's not okay, that that like doesn't count, that he should get off that, right? He should he should that he should drop that idea and take a real beloved, right? One who counts, one who's okay. This is important. So by itself, this is a really important thing, right? Um, we've talked about sort of the status of love and, um, you know, loving a married lady and what her husband is going to think of that and all that kind of, you know, like that's, um, this is a, a really important piece of data about that. The implication here is that within the people, um, among the ladies, right, who are, you know, keeping track of the love affairs, Guinevere is off the table. She's not okay for him to take as a, he can take, he should take anybody else. There's so many deserving people and all of them would have him. Married or not, it's not a marriage thing in general. Um, it, but Guinevere is different. Him loving Guinevere doesn't count. It's still a blemish in him. And I think the only thing that we can um, conclude from that is that it's it's a really big deal. Why would being the lover of Guinevere be a big deal? my dog breaking things over there why would why would um uh why would being why would being the the lover of the queen be a big deal 
Yes. Yes, Tom. It is treason. It is tre- it is political treason. It's not just immoral. It is a crime. It is a capital offense. A capital offense. Like if a woman got caught doing that, she might get burned at the stake, right? Uh, recalling our uh, uh, spoiler in the previous slide, right? So um, that seems to... I, I, I don't see why the lady would Im- at least implicitly accept, you know, uh, his relationship with Guinevere as like, again, as sort of not OK. Right. And not counting as him being a lover, um, unless apparently that is a line that everybody agrees. Knights, ladies, everybody agrees. You don't you don't go there. You don't cross that line. Right. You don't commit treason against King Arthur. Um you know, the duties of the beloveds and the demands of your of your beloved might come first before many other things. But apparently that's not one of them. So it's interesting that we have that as a uh, as a framework, as a big deal already. Second thing um, that is interesting about this is her accusation of sorcery, right, of enchantment, that Guinevere has ensnared him. Um, that seems to be... That seems to be uh, um, uh, slander. I don't think that's true. We have no evidence to support that. I don't think we're ever going to get evidence to support that. Um, but it, I'm sure, is a consoling idea to all those ladies out there who are trying to get Sir Lancelot for themselves. Right. Um, uh, but anyway, OK. Um, yeah, exactly, Matthew. The reason that... Uh, sleeping with the queen is an act of treason is it calls the succession into question. If there is any doubt about the sexual virtue of the queen, then the entire political structure and the succession is called into question. It can mean war, right? Um, it, there can be super, super ugly um, uh, uh, ramifications of that. So the queen has to be above reproach. And again, normally... Back in the 12th century, we weren't thinking about that so much, right? At least that never comes up. The queen is just like the ultimate beloved, right? So it's it's cool. Um, uh, she was like in charge of the whole courtly love thing. But um, that we don't seem to be operating with that here, which is already an interesting, an interesting point. Um, look at his response. Fire damsel, sighed Lancelot. I may not warn people to speak of me what it pleaseth him, but for it to be a wedded man, I think it not. For then I must couch with here, and leave armies and tournaments, battles and adventures. And as for... So, I'm not going to get married, right? I never thought me to be a wedded man. Um, because if I were married, I would have to be a good husband. And being a good husband would mean not traveling around as a knight errant all the time, right? I'd have to leave uh, tournaments and battles and adventures, right? I'd, I'd have to, like, couch with her. I'd have to stay home and sleep with my wife, right? I would have to stay home and be a, be a father, right? Uh, and, and, and a husband. Couch with her literally means sleep in her bed, um, which is, you know, an important duty of a husband. Um, but it, it also, it means, I think, uh, by extension, just like he's, he's gotta, he's gotta stay home. You know, he can't be out traveling all the time. Um, so yeah, uh, adventure, adventure, it's adventurous, uh, to, to, uh, um, uh, to be a knight adventurous, I think is, is that what you're quoting? Yeah. Um, yes. Oh, no. Advutrer. Sorry, that's a different word. We'll, we'll get there in just a second. Okay. So I'm not going to get married because then I'd have to give up the nightly, you know, the, the life that I have of, of knighting. Notice that there's also... Now, Tarloniel, that's a great point. Tarloniel says it doesn't seem to stop other married knights. You're right. Again, notice the conclusion we can draw from that, right? Um, uh the conclusion we can draw from Sir Lancelot is more virtuous than the average knight. The fact that Lancelot says, this is the moral standard that I want to hold myself to, doesn't mean everybody meets that standard. It doesn't even mean that he himself is always going to meet it. But he's saying, this is the standard, 
right? And we will see lots of examples of people who don't meet Lancelot's standards of what knights should do and how they should act, right? So you're absolutely right. That is a really important point. There are a bunch of bad husbands among the knights who still go out uh, and uh, act as adventurous knights. Um, but he said he wouldn't, he, he wouldn't do that. He couldn't do that. So what about the whole courtly love thing, Lancelot? Why, why wouldn't you take a lover then, right? Simple. No problem. Then you can have your adventurous life and also, you know, uh, play the game, right? The courtly love game. And, and all the ladies will be, well, okay, not all of them will be happy because most of them will be disappointed, but still. Um, and as for to say, to tuck my pleasance with paramours, that will I refuse in principle for dread of God, for knictes that been adventurous should not be advouters, Neither lecherous. Advouterers, that's an adulterer, uh, Bruce. An advouterer is an adulterer. Um, for knictes that been adventurous shall not be advouterers, neither lecherous. For than they be not happy, neither fortunate unto the wearers. For else they shall slay by unhap and hear cursedness other men, other bet. Uh, Wait, sorry. For other they shall be overcome with a simpler knight than they be himself. Other else they shall slay by unhap and hear cursedness better man than they be himself. And so who that useth paramours shall be unhappy and all thing unhappy that is about them. Wow. Okay. This is kind of revolutionary. This is kind of revolutionary. Um, uh, uh, yeah. So Karita, yes, those knights, those married knights who are out on the tournament circuit, they're bad husbands. Yes. Uh, by Lancelot's definition, they're bad husbands. Okay. Um, so, uh, okay. Um, Lancelot is against adultery so he, he, here he is saying, hey, everybody, you know what? Committing adultery is wrong. You shouldn't do that. And, and, and fornication, also not a good thing, right? Adventurous knights should not be adulterers or lecherous, right? You shouldn't be sleeping with folks. You, you know, you shouldn't be having sex outside of marriage and you shouldn't be committing adultery. Now, that might not sound like a a crazy thing to say, right? You know, Lancelot is sort of piping up here as if, like, you know, this is a revolutionary code, right? That that you should obey the basic, you know, moral codes of the church. But it is actually revolutionary. This is countercultural. And it's not just countercultural to the courtly tradition that Maori is taking part in here. It's even, as we've seen, countercultural to the world that he's been creating. Other knights don't do this, right? Sir Gawain doesn't abide by this, right? Um, uh, King Pelinor didn't abide by this. Uh, that, you know, we see lots of people who are accepted as good knights who have lovers. It's as she suggests. It's not only standard, it's expected. He's like everyone's tapping their foot like Lancelot. She's a beloved already, right? This is how it works, Lancelot. And Lancelot says, no, ma'am. No, ma'am. Um, and notice his explanation, right? Um, his explanation is, you're not going to be happy or fortunate. If, you, if you're a sinner, right? If you are an adulterer or a fornicator, you're not going to have God's blessing, for dread of God. <laughs> Again, like, whoa, really? Seriously? Like, you're taking that stuff seriously, Lancelot? That's kind of crazy uh, and kind of unusual. Um, and notice what he says happens, right? You know, if you end up, if you act wrong, right? If you put yourself in the wrong, if you don't follow the moral code, weird stuff is going to happen around you. You know, um, you're going to end up either you're going to lose to somebody that you shouldn't lose to or you're or worse. You're going to end up defeating somebody. You're going to end up killing somebody um, by unhap, by misfortune. Uh, 
uh, and his cursedness, right? I mean, it's your own cursedness is going to lead you into awkward situations like, I don't know, accidentally decapitating a lady, Sir Gawain, right? Sir Gawain's cursedness, right? His, uh, his unhap. Uh, it was his unhap to decapitate a lady accidentally, right? Why did that happen? Because he wasn't acting right, right? In Sir Gawain's adventure, we saw a direct example of that. Sir Lancelot is taking that idea and he's, he's extending it to sexual morality, which is a little bit crazy, right? Um, so... Yeah, Zach, exactly. Zach points out that even Arthur didn't follow Lancelot's standards. Absolutely. You're, you're completely correct. Completely correct. Now, we, we don't have any evidence that King Arthur's, uh, you know, done any sleeping around since he married Guinevere. But yeah, yeah, no, I mean, he, he didn't. Yeah. So no, uh, Carita unhappy, uh, in the sense of unlucky. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, Hmm. Kareta says, so adventuring knights should always be single in his estimation. Yes. Yes, they should. Now, does this mean that it's not okay to be in a... I mean, because he's in a relationship, right? I mean, let's go back a second here. Wherefore, Queen Guinevere had him in great favor above in all other knictes, and so he loved the queen again above in all other laddies days of his life. That's what we're told about him, right? He and Guinevere are a thing. She favors him more than anybody else. He favors her more than anybody else. There is a reciprocal attachment between Lancelot and Guinevere. And everybody knows about it, Right? And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that, right? There's nothing wrong with that so long as there's no hanky-panky, right? As long as there can be no reason even to question the validity of any succession, then it's fine. It's fine. One of the jobs, it seems, of Guinevere is to be, you know, sort of an encouragement and inspiration to the knights of Arthur's court. Um, so that Lancelot, the greatest of Arthur's knights, uh, goes around saying, I'm doing this all in Guinevere's name and for the love of Guinevere. That's okay. That's fine. It's good, really. So long as it's legit, so long as it's above board, so long as he sticks to his principles here, right? Um, okay. Um, yeah, Zach says, uh, uh, Lancelot, the St. Paul of the round table advocating a single life. Yeah. Uh-huh. That's exactly it. That's exactly it. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Now, and that's a really interesting point, David. David says we could replace Guinevere with Arthur in that sentence. Um, uh, this one here, uh, and it wouldn't read wrongly. Love can have many meanings. Exactly. It, it's, it's not, there's only one sense in which loving Guinevere is inappropriate, right? For him to have affection for her, for him to appreciate her, for him to devote himself to her service, perfectly okay, right? Uh, it's if you cross the line, uh, you know, in a physical relationship, then it's not okay. Right. Then you are an avuterer, uh, you're an adulterer and you're a really, really important. And it's a really, really important thing. Right. Um, yeah, <laughs> Mike. Exactly. Mike. This is so Lancelot saying I would that all knights would be as I. Right. Um, but if you not can, if, if you cannot contain, uh, let them marry. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Now, see, I agree with you. Uh, Dolores Stroke says um, Lancelot probably thought he could be celibate, um, as, and that's what he's suggesting here, right? Um, but as Saint Paul said, celibacy is the best, but it's not for everybody. Um, Lancelot is is being arrogant here. Instead of settling down with a nice lady, he shot too high and burned down Camelot. Yeah, uh, he's going to make mistakes. 
he's going he's gonna to make mistakes and lots of people are going to pay for those mistakes. There are going to be massive consequences uh, of those mistakes. Um, so, um, yeah, yeah. Um, and absolutely, uh, David Erbach, he does, Lancelot does see a difference between his devotion to the queen um, and an active romantic relationship. Yes. There was actually a category for this. Um, uh, they, in the old courtly love system, they talked about pure love and mixed love. Um, pure love is all of courtly love except for, uh, you know, home base, um, is fine. Uh, uh, even like you could go to third base, but you couldn't go to home base, to home plate. Like as it's it. Right. Um, I, whereas pure love, uh, mixed love is, you know, uh, uh, adding, uh, you know, the full hanky panky to it. So, um, that concept is there, right? Um, but, but Lancelot's not, they were playing with legalities there. I mean, again, like you could be, um, uh, you know, very technically practicing pure love uh, and still crossing all kinds of moral lines. Uh, Lancelot doesn't seem to be playing that way. Um, but um, anyway, uh, he, but, but that, and, and lip service was paid to the fact that pure love was higher like a, 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 a higher ideal than mixed love. But um, uh, there was a lot of ambiguity about that. Like it was lip service, but nobody really seemed to like when courtly lovers are actually talking with each other, they don't really seem to talk that way. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Um <laughs> David, I don't really want to uh, get into specifying about the bases, um, but uh, um, let me see if I can if I can quote Andreas Kapoanis's language on this. Pure love uh, embraces all of the acts of love including the naked embrace of the lover, only accepting the final act of Venus. I believe that is Andreas Capuanus's phrasing uh, approximately uh, and translated into English. Um, so <laughs> there you are. That's the definition. Um, okay. Um, now, Mike is is asking a great question. Does pride in his own piety come before a fall? Is it wrong for Lancelot to talk such big talk? Mike, not yet. Not yet. I think that what he's doing, um, what he's doing here is fine. For him to express these principles, devote himself to these principles, advocate for these principles, I don't think that this is culpable arrogance yet. But we're going to see plenty of moments later on when he is going to be tempted to push it one way or another, where he makes choices. It's going to get more complicated for Lancelot as time moves on, uh, is what I'm saying. So, okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay, good. Curry is glad we cleared up the bases. Okay, good. Excellent. Um, yeah. So anyway, yeah. So, so there's, w there will be lots more coming up. Notice, by the way, one of the themes of the book of Sir Lancelot here as a whole is putting Lancelot into awkward moral positions, right? Um, in, in particular, providing Lancelot with opportunities to compromise on his values, right? Are you going to cave, Lancelot? Under certain stressors, are you going to cave? Are you willing to, to compromise and not live up to the ideals of chivalry, when there's something on the line, right? When some, when your own life is on the line, when somebody else's life is on the line. Um, and we will see him being rather deliberately placed in several different kinds of awkward scenarios to sort of see how he will act. And again, in general, in this book, he acquits himself really well. But remember, what this book is kind of doing is establishing a baseline 
for Lancelot, right? The difficult tests have not come yet. This is this is this is this is warm up, right? This is spring training for Lancelot. Uh, this whole book, right? Um, he's not going to confront any really challenging situations until later on, right? And he will be faced with some very much more, um, uh, some very much more difficult moral dilemmas and involving uh, Queen Guinevere, um, and. Um, the um the the and never mind uh, uh, okay what well, I'll, I'll i'll give you one merlin like spoiler it is not obvious that guinevere herself shares lancelot's convictions here right uh that will be one of the issues that he will be confronting down the road um so okay um all right. Uh, <laughs> see, yeah, Stephen, I think I did go to spring training as a metaphor because I'm already thinking about baseball. <laughs> Never mind. Let's move on. But again, important baseline. I don't think there's any chance we're getting through the book of Sir Lancelot tonight. All right. Um, I want to. I want to then moving on to specific adventures, having established his high moral principles. Uh, I want to move on to. Uh, th- these are two sort of classic illustrations of his role as knight. Right. Um, first is his confrontation with Sir Tarquin, and not chronologically first in the story, um, but the first one I want to talk about. Um, Sir Tarquin is the the he's the he's the knight's bad knight. Right. He is possibly the second greatest knight in the world currently, right? It, nobody is strong enough. He's beaten everybody except Lancelot, right? He's got Lancelot's own kin uh, in his prison. Gawain is in his prison. Uh, Marhold is in his prison. Everybody's in his prison, right? I mean, he's got half of the round table in his prison uh, stripped down naked and beaten with thorns on a regular basis, just kind of on principle and for fun, um, because he's a bad guy uh, and treating people with exceptional, exceptionally poor hospitality. Uh, uh, he has a... Um, uh, he has a um, he has a, a, a spite against the Knights of the Round Table, right? So Lan- it's like obviously Lancelot's manifest destiny uh, and Tarquin's manifest destiny to face each other, right? In fact, like everyone's talking about this, like when will Lancelot come along? And like only Sir Lancelot could possibly uh, take out Sir Tarquin uh, and set everybody free. Um, Sariasin is asking, is he named for Tarquinius uh, Superbus, uh, that is King Tarquin of uh, 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 Rape of Lucretia fame uh, from Roman history? I I think, Sarah, the name is not a coincidence. Um, I I think it's being used kind of generically in the sense of like really powerful, unscrupulous bad guy. I don't think we're really supposed to be. I mean, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe somebody could make a uh, could do a reading that would really uh, uh, that I would think would be really cool of like ways in which this Sir Tarquin is kind of like, you know, King Tarquin, um, the rapist. But uh, apart from being a violator of hospitality, there's no really obvious uh, uh, parallels between them, again, other than just being a bad guy in a powerful position. Um, But uh, anyway, so here they are. Uh, Sir Tarquin and Sir Lancelot finally squaring off, right? Um, uh, after uh, he's defeated, Dark Tarquin has defeated all these knights. Um, and it comes this moment where they've been fighting for a long time and they fought each other to a standstill. And Sir Tarquin has a, um, uh, has a proposal, right? He's like, hey, you know, you're really strong. You're like the best knight I've ever fought against, man. Um, so I propose that the two of us stop fighting and we swear eternal friendship and we like be best friends until the day we die. Right. And never fail other ever again. You remember this happens, right? We, we saw this happen with Gawain and Marhalt, right? Just a little while back. Um, this is a kind of a thing you do when you meet up with somebody and you like fight to a draw and you just, so that's a, that's a good thing. Right. That would be a positive outcome here. Um, But of course, in proposing this, Tarquin says there's, of course, only one exception. Uh, uh, There's one person in the world with whom I, you know, so you have to tell me your name because there's one person in the world with whom I could never possibly swear an oath of friendship like that. uh, And I would have to continue fighting to the death if you happened to be uh, this one person. 
Ye say well, cite Sir Lancelot, but sithen it is so that I have thy friendship and may have, what connect is that that thou hattest above an all thing? Faithfully, cite Sir Tarquin, his name is Sir Lancelot de Lac, for he slew my brother Sir Caradus at the Dolorous Tower, that that was one of the best connectors on live, and therefore him I accept of all connectors, for may I him on his meat, the ton shall make an end. I make mine a vow, and for Sir Launcelot is sack I have slain an hundred good connectors, and as many I have maimed all utterly, that they might never after help themselves, and many have died in prison, and yet have I threescore and four, and all shall be delivered, so thou wilt tell me thy name, so be it that thou be not Sir Launcelot. Now say, see I will said Sir Launcelot, that such a man I might be, I might have peace, and such a man I might be, that there shall be mortal war betwixt us. And now, Sir Knecht, at thy request, I will that thou wait and know that I am Sir Launcelot du Lac, King Banis son of Benwick, and very Knecht of the table ruined, and now I defy thee, and do thy best." Um, notice how he spells this out, right? Again, so Tarquin says, all of the evil things I've done, right? All the people I've killed, all the prisoners I've abused and maimed. Um, and, and I assume, by the way, when he talks about maiming folks, he means in, in battle, right? Um, but, you know, many of them have died in his prison anyway. So, like, that's also, you know, an option. Um, so, anyway, all these knights that I've killed, all of them that I've maimed, all of them that I've imprisoned, and I've still got 60 back at home right now, right? Um, all those I did for hatred of Sir Lancelot, right? Uh, because Sir Lancelot killed my brother. Um, but notice the kind of temptation that he lays before Sir Lancelot, right? And like I said, this is a kind of a... This is... A, this is I was about to say this is this is a uh, uh, this is a hanging curveball. Look at me with the baseball stuff, right? Tom, I can't help it. It's almost the postseason. Um, um, but uh, uh, anyway, um, <laughs> so uh, this is an easy one, right? Um, but you can see Lancelot himself spells out the simple moral quandary that he's in, right? This is the choice that confronts him. If all he has to do is lie. All he has to do is say to Sir Tarquin, oh, oh, Lancelot, no, never heard of him, right? No, you know, my name is Jeff, um, uh, uh, Sir Jeff uh, of the mountain. Um, uh, pleased to meet you. And then he'd be like, great, we're friends forever. I'm going to let everybody go. Like with one word, he can get out of this fight, which is the, one of the hardest fights Lancelot's ever been in, we're told, right? Sir Turquin fights him, fights Lancelot to a standstill, which very few are able to do. Um, Sir, Turquin is a, Sir, Sir Turquin is a legitimate threat, right? And uh, he, Lancelot, could get out of this fight without having to worry about being overcome, Right. And losing his reputation by losing this battle and stuff. And he can still save everybody. Right. He, all 60 prisoners will be set free. And all he has to do is deny his own name. All he has to do is just tell a little lie. Right. Uh, and say that he's not Lancelot. Um, uh But of course, he's not going to do that. Again, notice he lays that out. Um, I see that such a man I might be, I might have peace, right? If I were willing to do that, I could have peace. It's right, it's right here, right? I mean, this, it's all, this is the, the way out of this um, difficult fight, the way out of this uh, challenging situation has been handed to me on a platter, right? And if I were such a man, I could do that, right? Or if I were a different kind of man, there would be mortal war between us, right? But so I'm going to tell you right now which man I am. Right. And that is the one who's going to admit to you that I'm Sir Lancelot of the Lake. And I'm going to give you my full name. Right. And very knicked of the round table. True knight of the of the table rune. And that's uh, very knicked uh, in more than one sense. Right. Uh, and truly, I am a knight of the round table, but also I am a true knight of the round table. Um, and therefore, he's not going to lie about who he is. And he's not going to try to achieve victory by deception. Um, so again, this is relatively simple, but again, we can, we're establishing a baseline. We can see 
what are the circumstances that Lancelot is being put in? How does he respond? What is what would what would Lancelot do? Right. We're, we're establishing the answer to the question. What would Lancelot do in situations like this? And of course, he's going to end up winning the combat anyway, as we know, uh, and he's going to set them all free and it's going to be fine. Um, but uh, but he is the knight who not only is going to admit his own name, he's the knight who's going to stand up against and bring Sir Tarquin to task for all of the evil that he's done, right? It, that also is an element of the potential compromise that he would be making here, right? Are you going to save your own skin? Are you going to do what's wrong to save your... Are you going to condone what's wrong? For him to swear, you know, eternal friendship with this knight who has committed the crimes that he's committed would be wrong. That would be wrong. I, this guy is not... He's not good B BFF material for Sir Lancelot, right? He's just not. Um unless he were to change his own ways, right? Um, and even that, maybe you could you could suggest that that's part of the temptation here, right? That he is saying, if you just tell me you're not Sir Lancelot, then I'll mend my ways, right? I'll let everybody go. But I don't think he's really saying he's going to mend his ways because he's saying, I've done all this for the hatred of Sir Lancelot. So presumably if Lancelot told him he was somebody else, like Sir Tarquin would still continue waiting for Sir Lancelot to come along, right? Um yeah. Uh, Sarah, he does make no apologies for killing Sir Carados. Um, and again, I don't th know that uh, any apologies are needed. Um, uh, he probably did kill Sir Carados at the Dolorous Tower. Um, that kind of thing happens a lot. And Sir Carados is not a paragon himself. Um, uh, I think Sir Carados deserved it. But more than that, um, like, you know, it's a contact sport being an adventurous knight, you know, like people get killed. Uh, and if somebody kills somebody else in open, fair combat to react to that, like Sir Tarquin has uh, and to um, um, to, uh, um, to, yeah, to to react to that as Sir Tarquin has and to, you know, swear this to go on this campaign of vengeance uh against somebody who killed your brother fairly in open combat that's 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 wrong understandable maybe um but that's that that doesn't put sir tarquin in the right doesn't justify sir tarquin's actions um and i don't think that sir lancelot needs to uh needs to apologize uh for what he's done um yeah yeah um yeah david there 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 isn't we don't see where guild happening um no no uh, yeah, if somebody dies, that's just kind of the way it goes. Yeah, I mean, you might be... I mean, if Lancelot kills somebody and then, like, meets that person's sister or, you know, girlfriend and she's real upset, he's going to be sorry for her sorrow, right? But, you know, I mean, you know, it kind of happens. But again, he's as careful as he can be. And you'll notice he doesn't kill a lot of people by accident. Um uh, he wounds folks, <laughs> right? But uh, that's another thing that we see. Um, he doesn't, uh, there aren't a lot of people that end up dead accidentally along his path, unlike Gawain, David Erbach, exactly. Um, and why, right? Because he's, you know, it, 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 a lack of cursedness, right? Uh, that unhap business. Right? Again, if you're living right, that kind of thing is going to happen to you as often. Gawain. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Brian, I agree. Uh, Brian Dimmick says it seems to be a sign of a dishonorable knight to not understand or acknowledge the distinction between killing someone in fair combat and murdering someone or, or, or killing someone in treachery. Yeah. Yeah. Remember, this was what the what the the point of conflict was between Sir Balin and the old uh, the brief. <laughs> the briefly tenured lady of the lake, right? Um, this kind of disagreement happens. Um, yeah, yeah. And Michelle, you're absolutely right that he does go out of his way not to kill people uh, in this uh, in this tale. We see him, we see him do that. Um, uh, yeah, he just, yeah, he will, he'll knock them down, knock them out. He'll run them through just a little bit, right? But he'll... Um, uh, he, he, won't, he won't kill them. He'll deliberately not kill them. Um, whereas when Lancelot is, uh, is, is serious, right? Uh, if, 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 uh, if death is his intention, 
it tends to happen uh, relatively quickly, um, often in one shot. Um, so, yeah, yeah, we see him pull his punches a lot, um, both with the lance and with the sword, uh, honestly. Um, so this is another reason why I, uh, I think that it's, it's, there's every reason to think that uh, uh, Sir Carados of the Dolorous Tower um, had it coming <laughs> to him. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, it happens. Um, immediately after he fights Sir Tarquin, we get the next guy. This is still his damsel, the one with whom he was having the conversation we already talked about. Seer, said the damsel, here by this way, Hount is a knight that distresses all ladies and gentlewomen, and at the least he robbeth them, or there lieth by him. What? sighed Lancelot. Is he a thief and a knight, and a ravisher of women? He doth sham unto the order of knighthood, and contrary unto his oath. It is pity that he liveth. But, fairer damsel, ye shall ride on before yourself, and I will keep myself in covert, and if that he trouble you, other distress you, I shall be your rescue, and learn him to be ruled as a knight. So this maid rode on by the way, a, a, a soft ambling pass, and within a while come out a knight on horseback, out of the wood, and his page with him, and there he put the damsel from her horse, and then she cried. And with, with that come Sir Launcelot as fast as he meeked, till he come to the knight, sighing, Ah, false knight, and traitor unto knighthood, who did learn thee to distress laddies, damsels, and gentlewomen? And then he learns him, right? Uh, he's going to learn him to be ruled as a knight, uh, chiefly by cutting his head in half, right? And that uh, uh, turns out to be an excellent pedagogical strat <laughs> strategy uh, for this particular night. Um so the um the sort of uh uh diptych here of Sir Turquin on the one hand and Sir I forget this guy's name Paris or something like that uh uh who is uh, uh the other side of it right you've got the one knight who distresses all the men and the other knight who distresses all the ladies and the damsel makes that explicit she she talks about the two of them right um you know got the the, the anti-man one and the anti-woman one and Lancelot, <laughs> oh, Mike, that's awful. Mike says he did change his mind. Yes, he did. Uh, he rearranged it, certainly. Um, but anyway, um, uh, so, okay. Lancelot stands up to both of them and is, uh, you know, a, 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 a objects in the strongest terms, both to how Sir Tarquin treats men and how... Uh, uh, I, I forget this. Can somebody remind me of this dude's name? It's later on there on page 160, just like the next paragraph. I'm just forgetting. Um, but um, uh, anyway, yeah. So so he, uh, uh, he, he, he deals with both of them. We see him here in these two instances, like defending policing, really, right? Knighthood. Like, this is how knights should act. You don't act like Sir Tarquin on the one side. Don't act like Sir What's-His-Name on the other side, right? Be good, you know, be, be, treat other knights honorably, even if you defeat them in battle, right? Don't then take them and lock them up and strip them naked and whip them with thorns. That's just not how you should be. Um, and on the other hand, don't molest women, right? Don't rob women. Is he a thief and a ravisher of women? Oh, man. Notice... Uh, the, the emphasis of uh, the, the, Lancelot's word choice is really fascinating here, right? Notice, is he a thief and a knight and a ravisher of women? Right? He's like, that, that's not possible. Like, you can't be all of those things. If you're a ravisher of women and a thief, you can't be a knight. If you're going to be a knight, you can't be a thief and ravisher of women. It's like, by definition, that's not okay, right? It's not just like knights should aspire not to do that. He's like, that's a contradiction in terms, right? Um, he does shame to the entire order of knighthood and contrary to his oath. It's pity that he lives, right? This guy is giving knighthood itself a bad name. Uh, everyone should understand. It's one thing to be like Sir Gawain, right? And occasionally do the, the, the despicable thing. It's another thing to just flatly disregard what it is to be a knight. If you're going to go around calling yourself a knight and act like that, like either one of those dudes, right? Either Sir Tarquin or this guy, Sir Paris. Yeah, it is Sir Paris of the, of the Forest Sauvage. That's what I. That's what I thought. Um, 
he does come from the Savage Forest, uh, Carrie, like Sir Balin also came from the Savage Forest. Um, yet, uh, Josiah, I can't help but think that Sir Paris is not a an accident, right? I mean, like Paris. You've got Sir Hector and Sir Paris, right? Um, uh, Sir Paris has an issue with women. Uh, the knight Sir Paris, who is a ravisher of women. I mean, come on, that's a little on the nose, right? Isn't it just a little bit? Um, he probably makes off with Spartan kings' wives, or wives, you know, if he if he if he gets half a chance, right? Um, I mean, come on. So. Uh, um, exactly, Karita. We have rules here as knights, you schmucks. That's exactly his point of view, right? He is going to, he is not only going to represent, he's not only himself going to follow the path of knight, but it's, he's not going to, like, this kind of deviation, he's not going to stand for it. But notice another thing. Now, it's a little bit funny, I can't help but laugh just a little bit, that he uses the damsel as bait. Uh, but that in itself is interesting. What does that suggest? What is what is interesting about the fact that he uses the damsel as bait? Why why is that important? I think it is important. Why is that important? She does trust him, and it is interesting that she trusts him. She has confidence in him, and he is challenging her, in a sense, to have confidence in him. But I don't think it's a test of her, first and foremost. I mean, she's just said... So, oh yeah, by the way, there's around here a knight who distresses all ladies and gentlewomen and he like robs them and he lies by them and it's, uh, he's pretty bad. Carita, absolutely. He insists, Lancelot, apparently, on catching this knight in the act, right? Trust but verify, Boomful, exactly. He is trusting but verifying what the damsel is saying to him, right? Because remember, now notice a couple things there, right? On the one hand, we have... Burden of proof, right? He he he's he's willing to convict Sir Paris and to uh, execute him, right? Um, in knightly fashion, he's gonna he's gonna fight him and he's not gonna give him quarter, right? He's gonna he's he's not he doesn't pull his punches with Sir Paris. Sir Paris goes down with a bisected head quickly, right? Um, so he's willing to act as judge and executioner over Sir Paris, but he's not willing to execute him on hearsay. Right. The the damsel says, oh, I hear that. Remember, this is the same damsel who also heard that Guinevere is in, uh, uh, has ensorcelled him. Right. You know, you can't always trust rumors. It doesn't mean that he thinks that she's lying, though. Again, that would not be totally unprecedented. Um, you know, one can easily imagine that him going and killing this knight and then come to find out that he's actually a perfectly respectable knight, but killed her brother or something. And she was taking vengeance against him. It's a kind of thing that we've seen happen, right? Um, so, uh, so anyway, yeah, he, 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 he insists on catching him in the act. And when he does, it's all over, right? Um, uh, the, so th that's, that, that's one thing that I think is interesting. Again, it shows his standards. Notice how he is steering clear of many of the, pitfalls that knights like Sir Balin and Sir Gawain fall right into, even King Arthur fall right into, right? Rash vows, um, uh, precipitous actions without being really certain of what the facts are, right? We see Lancelot acting thoughtfully, wisely, and carefully, even in those regards, right? Um, so it's, it's more than just like following his own moral code and that kind of thing. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, I'm gonna do. So I'm gonna do our, our drawing soon. Um, not quite yet. I'm gonna I'm gonna do that at the at near the stroke of midnight. I'm gonna do that, and then we'll and then we'll end. I said I'm not really gonna finish all the tales or Lancelot tonight. It is too much fun to rush through. Um, but um, yeah, I, like I said, I just love his his language here. Um, False knight and traitor unto knight toad. Who did learn thee? To distress Lottie. Like, who taught you that? Where did you learn that? Like, it's like he can't even understand, right? Like, this is not like a knight who has given into temptation, right? He's like, wait, where did you even get this idea that you're going to be a knight who, like, routinely just accosts women and robs and rapes them? Like, it's, it's, it's just so alien that, 
Lancelot can't even understand it, right? So I love that that's what he's yelling as he comes riding in uh, as fast as he might. Um, who did learn you to do this? Uh, you are so weird. Okay. Um, <laughs> ooh, ooh, Bruce says, maybe he learned it from King Pelinor. Oh, oh, burn. Um, yeah. Oh, oh. Uh, King Pelinor deserved that. Um, uh, Michelle asks, is it odd that there seem to be a lot of damsels wandering around the countryside by themselves? Well, is it odd? It depends on your point of view. I mean, I don't know, Michelle. The landscape seems to be just lousy with wandering damsels and and random adventures, right? I mean, it's a kind of thing that seems to happen a lot. And sometimes the damsels themselves are the adventures. Uh, remember the three damsels hanging out by the fountain, waiting for knights to come along so they could lead them on it, you know, so that damsels could lead the knights on adventures with Gawain, Uwain, and Marhalt. I mean, you know, it's like, this is, this is the, this is the world that we're living in, right? It's just, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So, uh, uh, Carrie says it's nightly to defend women, put them on pedestals, worship them and to put them in danger to further your own glory. Oh, that's a little harsh, Carrie. Uh, you know, she's not in serious danger, right? He's not going to let things escalate as he, as he, you know, he's, he, he comes right in. She's perfectly safe. Right. Uh, you know, probably, uh, unless the knight had come out and just like gone straight for decapitation on that particular day, then things would have gotten awkward. But, you know, he, he was, he was there, right? It's, perfect. it's, it's perfectly fine. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, several people have been reminded at various points uh, this evening about uh, uh, Zoot and Dingo and the, uh, the 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 castle of maidens uh, that we get in <laughs> Monty Python and the Holy Grail. There's actually a specific moment that inspires that, uh, and it involves uh, uh, Sir Galahad. Um, uh, in fact, uh, it's during the Grail quest. Um, but uh, but yeah, that <laughs> that kind of idea we'll see all over the place. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, Yeah, Karita, I agree. His his failure rate at uh, the damsel protection quests um, is very low. It isn't zero, as you say, but it is. But it is pretty low. He's got pretty good odds of uh, of coming through here. Well, let me look at. You remember when I talked about a day in the life of Sir Balin, right? You know, one of those when like all of a sudden everybody around you, like you're like here you are minding your own business and just trying to do what's right, and the next thing you know, you're surrounded by corpses, right? That was a day in the life of Sir Balin. Here's a day in the life of Sir. Lancelot. So he goes to, he takes a nap, right? It's a, it's a hot day. It's noontime. He takes a nap under a tree. Uh, his uh, uh, kinsman, Sir Lionel, goes off and gets himself captured by Sir Tarquin while he's asleep. Um, he uh, is still asleep when four queens, including Morgan Le Fay, come across him there in the field and are like, hey, that's Lancelot. And she's like, Morgan Le Fay is like, I'll cast him into an enchanted sleep and take him to our, my castle. So he wakes up in the castle of four queens. Uh, not knowing how he got there, to be confronted with this. Sir Knicht, the Fora Queen is sighed, thou must understand, thou art our prisoner, and we know well that thou art Sir Launcelot du Lac, King Banis son. And because that we understand your worthiness, that thou art the noblest Knicht living, and also we know well that there can no lady have thy love but on, and that is Queen Guinevere, and knew thou shalt her love lose for ever, and she thine. For it behoveth thee now to choose one of us four, for I am Queen Morgan Le Fay, Queen of the land of Gore, and here is the Queen of North Gallus, and the Queen of Estland, and the Queen, uh, the Queen of Eastland, and the Queen of the Out Isles. Now choose one of us, which that thou wilt have to thy paramour, other else to die in this prison. 
This is a hard cuss, said Sir Lancelot. Right, again, so this is, this is how Lancelot's average day goes, right? You lie down to take a nap, and then you wake up imprisoned by enchantresses who say, choose one of the four of us, like, rich, powerful, and beautiful queens to take as your paramour, or else you die, right? Uh, I'm, you suddenly find yourself in a, like, contrived situation designed to test your sexual constancy, right? Your sexual virtue and your, and your, and your amorous constancy to Queen Guinevere. Um, but notice she acknowledges it, right? Um, you have no lady but one, which is Queen Guinevere, uh, and, uh, and, and she loves you. But as of today, that's over, right? You're going to lose her love and she's going to lose yours because here's the new situation. You're choosing one of us or you're going to die. This is a hard cast, sighed Sir Launcelot, that other I must die, other to choose one of you. Yet had I lever die in this prison, and w with worship, than to have one of you to my paramour, magre mine head. And therefore, ye be answered, I wall none of you, for ye be false enchanters. And as for my lady, Dame Guinevere, were I at my liberty as I was, I would prove it on yours, that she is the truest lady unto her lord living. Well, said the queeness, is this your answer, that ye will refuse us? Yea, on my life, said Sir Launcelot, refused ye been of me. Okay, let me make no, the, no uncertain terms, right? Refused you be of me. Um, he's not, um, he's not gonna mince words. He's not going to try to get out of it, right? He's like, remember, those of you who have read Sir Gawain and the Green Knight will remember when Sir Gawain and Sir Gawain and the Green Knight found himself in this position. Not exactly this position, but when he found himself in an awkward, amorous situation, right, uh, where he was forced to either refuse the lady, or which would be bad, or to accept the lady, which would also be very bad, um, he found a clever, courteous sort of devious way out of it, right? Lancelot, nope, right? Refused ye been of me, right? I choose death. I choose plan B because I would rather die with worship than to have one of you to paramour mogger my head, right? I'm not going to, like, if I'm kill, if you guys kill me, it does me no harm. I mean, apart from the death thing, but I would rather die uh, than uh, take you guys as paramour against my will, mogger mine head, which is one of my favorite expressions. Um, yeah, uh, Tara, I agree. We know Gawain would have made a different choice. He certainly would have. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, notice. So he says, again, first of all, no, I'm not going to take you as paramour. Um because, by the way, you're false enchantresses, anyhow, right? And as for my laddie, Dame Guinevere, were I at my liberty, as I was, like before y'all captured me, I would prove it on yours, that is, on your champion, that she is the, un the truest lady to her lord living. Um, it's like, if you're suggesting that Guinevere and I are practicing mixed love, that is vile slander, and I will fight to the death to show you that you're wrong. Right. Um, she is the truest lady under her Lord living, and he is going to defend that. This is super important. There is no reason. There is no reason to disbelieve Lancelot here. There is absolutely no evidence to support the idea that Lancelot is lying when he says this, that Gawain, that Guinevere is the truest lady under her lord living. She is faithful to her husband. Um, one of the things that I find is that modern readers don't want to believe Lancelot. When Lancelot says his piece about sexual morality and that he thinks it's wrong to be an adulterer um, and that that is not what love should be like. Uh, and then he says Guinevere is chaste 
right? She is she is true to her husband. Um, there is nothing inappropriate about my relationship with Guinevere. Every single time I have taught this text in a college setting, all of my students are sniggering. They're like, oh, yeah, Lancelot, whatever you say. We have no reason to suspect it other than our own modern desire, which is kind of common in modern readers, not to believe that someone can really be very good, right? If somebody holds themselves up as a moral paragon, we tend to assume that they must be a hypocrite, therefore. Um, and again, Lancelot is not going to be perfect. He is going to stumble. He is going to fall. Um, but he is not simply a hypocrite from the beginning. <laughs> Mike Moore says, I did not have sexual relations with that queen. <sighs> See, exactly. Exactly, Mike. Um, uh, uh, yes. Uh, if you're, if you're, if Bill Clinton, if Bill Clinton quotations are going through your head when you're hearing Sir Lancelot say that Guinevere is the truest lady to her Lord living, that's exactly the problem. <laughs> that's exactly the problem. Um, um, Milthalio says, uh, is this why we have reverse Faramir in the film? Yes, I believe, yes, that it is the same thing. Uh, the reason that Faramir, as depicted in the book, was too good for them to do in the film, that the filmmakers thought that if they were true to, to book Faramir, modern people wouldn't be able to connect with him, wouldn't be able to relate with him. That's I Yes, I think that's exactly the same kind of thing that's going on here. Um so, yeah, um, again, he's not, he's not, uh, he's not perfect. He's not inhuman. He's going to struggle and, 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 and I, I separate those two things. There will be times when he struggles and there will be, he's going to fall. We know it's going to, things are going to go bad. Merlin told us so, right? But he means it. And Again, what are we doing in this book? We're establishing the baseline. And I think it is crucial, crucial, crucial for us to accept Lancelot's word here. The baseline of Sir Lancelot is in chaste love with the queen who chastely returns his love uh, in a way that is totally appropriate and absolutely culturally uh, acceptable and morally acceptable. And he holds that that's the way it should always be. And he's not going to play by any other rules. He rejects any other kind of love than the perfectly clean and appropriate love that he has for Guinevere and which they can practice right in front of Arthur. And which Arthur can not only, not only is it okay for Arthur to know about it, he applauds it. It's appropriate. It's good for Lancelot and Guinevere uh, to be like mutually uh, admiring and having mu mutual admiration and affection for each other. Like that's perfectly okay. Um, Mike, he is ready to prove it on yours by violence. That doesn't mean he's ready to, I, I, I think when, when he says yours, he means your champion. Um, he, that's why he doesn't say I'll prove it on you, right? He's not going to, he's not challenging them to a duel. He's not saying he's going to beat them up if they don't take it back. Um, but he is saying, I will like name a champion and I will fight him. I don't care. Um, I will defend this. Uh, that's not only an offer of proof, that's a threat, right? Like if you continue saying that, like, I, I'm going to like, that's not okay. I'm not going to stand for that, right? I'm going to challenge you, um, I am going to I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to publicly uh, accuse you of slander and demand a combat with your champion. Um, yeah, Jennifer, I agree with you. Jennifer Pope says it's strange that in more modern adaptations, it's Arthur who introduces all the high minded rules and ideals. But here it's Lancelot. Yes, yes, that I agree is a is a Arthur is a great knight, not only a good, you know, a great king, but a great individual knight. We saw that being sort of established. You know, he had his own adventures and did reasonably well. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, it, it certainly built up some personal worship for himself and, and, and did very well, of course, in the, uh, uh, in the Roman campaign, um, both as a general and on the battlefield. But, um, 
No, uh, Jennifer, you're right. He is not the one who is the upholder of the highest standards. Um, it is Lancelot who is the uh, not only the representative of, but uh, the advocate for, the policer of, as we saw in the previous slide. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, Josiah, there certainly is precedent for knights swapping off the heads of enchantresses. Absolutely. Um, but Josiah, I, I, I really do think that that's, that's why he says yours there. He's not, Lancelot isn't Sir Balin, right? He's not going to put himself into the Sir Balin situation. Um, the, the, if you're playing the, what would Sir Balin do game, Josiah, I think the answer might be start swapping off heads here and now, right? Uh, but if you're playing the what would Sir Lancelot do, what Sir Lancelot would do is publicly and openly charge, uh, challenge them, you know, charge them with lying and slandering his uh, 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 the Queen Guinevere, and um, have an open, publicly witnessed combat in which he uh, defends the fact that uh, they're wrong. Um. Um, so Mike is asking, uh, you know, how, how do they think that violence proved the point? And, uh, you know, is it just a willingness to defend them or God siding with the winner? Uh, yes, we will see the God siding with the winner doctrine, which was, as I said, condemned by the church, but nevertheless largely held by people in this world, apparently. Um, but it's also the former, the, the, the willingness that is like, if you, are you willing to, in danger, you know, to, to, to put your life on the line in this quarrel, right? You know, would, do, are you willing to put your money where your mouth is, right? This is the, the uh, that's the, this is the Arthurian equivalent, you know, of that expression, essentially. Um, and not only that, it's, it's a public statement as well, right? I am going to publicly um, proclaim and align myself with the fact that she is honorable, right? And I, I'm going to, I am, I am willing to defend that against anyone. Um, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, um, yeah, David, that's interesting. Um, uh, David Atley suggests that, um, modern stories tend to take the person with the greatest strength and the person with the greatest virtue and tend to sort of separate and juxtapose those two facets. Um, yeah, I agree. Uh, um, yeah. Um, the other thing that I would say, remember, um, uh, who was it who was talking about, uh, Faramir? Um, I'm forgetting already. Um, but, oh yeah, Milthaliel. Um, remember when I was talking about the Faramir thing, um, the phrase I used is that they obviously thought that modern filmgoers couldn't relate to Book Faramir, right? In my opinion, um, David, that's the major shift, right? Um, we as readers have to relate to the characters in books. Like, they have to look like us. And since we're probably not as strong and noble as Lancelot, it's going to fall flat to us, right? Because that's not me. I can't, I'm, I'm not Sir Lancelot, right? I can't relate to Sir Lancelot. In the Middle Ages, they believe very strongly that the, you know, your job as you're reading this tale of Sir Lancelot is not to relate to him. It's to admire him, right? He is a standard that you can aspire to. And no, you are probably not going to achieve the standards of Sir Lancelot. Even if you do manage to live a really good moral life, you probably don't have his thews, right? I'm sorry, you're just not as big and well-breathed as he is. He's both the greatest athlete in the world and also the paragon of virtue, so I'm sorry, that is probably not you, right? Um, but that's not the point, right? That's not the point. The point is that he is someone to admire, just as Faramir and Aragorn are people to admire, not just to connect with, not just to not just to see yourself reflected in, right? Um, uh, yeah. So that's that's and Milthalia, that's exactly what you were saying too. Yeah, the importance of being able to look up to them. That is very much uh, what the plan seems to be here for Sir Lancelot. But again, notice. Um, 
he's not going to be perfect. He's not going to be, his role is not simply to be, you know, I am the embodiment of all that is good and right that you should aspire to. Um, we are going to see him fall, right? Uh, Mallory is going to kind of have his cake and eat it too when it comes to Sir Lancelot um, because he is going to be everything that everybody would want to be like, right? Um, and yet we are going to be able to relate to him. He is going to be, um, you know, he is he is going to be tempted in all ways like unto ourselves, but, and with sin, right? Um, he is going to, he is going to fall. So we will be able to, we will see, that he is, in fact, human, like we are. So, again, Mallory kind of has it both ways, um, uh, which I think is really interesting. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. So, okay, um, I'm going to... I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop here. Um, oh, okay, no, Josiah, I'll answer your question. Then I'm going to stop. Josiah says, why exactly are these queens after Lancelot? Like, what's the deal here? Are they just wanting to debase his worthiness? Like, you are high and we're wanting to tear you down? Um, I think they're wanting to build themselves up. Um, because we understand your worthiness, that thou art the noblest knight living, um, therefore you must choose one of us. Because... If he chooses one of the one that he chooses, notice the classical parallel here. There's just a tiny bit of Paris and the golden apple of discord here, choosing between the goddesses, right? It's not, it's not a direct parallel, but again, there's like, like the the one of them that he chooses is going to be the worthiest, right? Um, I. I think there's a certain like bragging rights among the four of them, right? Based on what the damsel says, he is the most eligible bachelor in all of Logris, right? It is going to be, it is be, I mean, whoever is accepted as his lady is going to become the head of the, the women's hierarchy in all of Logris, right? That's a fact. Um, and they seem to cover that it's a power play on their part. It's it's about prestige, Carrie. Exactly, exactly. Um, and Bruce, yes, there would be there would definitely be an argument to say that uh, Sir Lancelot's beloved could potentially even outrank Queen Guinevere in the rankings, especially if she is also a queen, right? Um, remember, these are not just four beautiful women. These are not just four enchantresses. These are four queens. Right. Um, so they already have a pretty good resume. Um, they're, uh, you know, maybe one step below Guinevere in the rankings. If they get Lancelot, too, they've got a pretty good case. Right. Um, no, Carrie, they don't want to marry him. Not interested in marriage. None of them are interested in marriage. Uh, half, mo most of them are married. Uh, well, I mean, uh, Morgan Le Fay is separated from her husband, but he's still alive, I think. Uh, Urians is still alive. Um, we know that the Queen of North Gallus of North Wales is still alive. because Gallus is Wales, by the way. Um, we know the Queen of North Gallus is... Because, is, is, like, that's the king who is holding the tournament that uh, that um, Lancelot fights in on behalf of uh, uh, Sir Bagdamagus. So, um, or King Bagdamagus. So, so yeah, no, it, we know for a fact that several of them are, are married, and I have no reason to think that uh, that all four of them aren't married. So yeah, no, that's fine. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, good. All right. So I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna pause here. I'm, I'm not gonna pause here. I'm gonna we're gonna stop here. We'll come back to we'll finish the adventures of Sir Lancelot next time. Uh, having having you know sort of established a lot of the framework of what we're looking at. We'll look at his other adventures, including my favorite one, uh, the. Uh, the adventure that never ceases to uh, surprise and amuse me, the adventure of the necrophiliac sorceress. But um, let's do our drawings. Okay, so uh, I want to do, uh, as I said, I want to do the two drawings. Let me get my, uh, uh, let me get my, so first I'm going to do, uh, first, I'm going to do the, the donor drawing. So the, the, the drawing for people who made donations during the course of class, as I said. Let's see. Okay. Excellent. Oh, wow. Lots of very generous donations today. 
Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Oh, that is so great. Okay. So let me see. Let me do some quick counting here. Uh, okay. Now, so I've got to count so then I know which uh, which die to use. Okay. All right. Okay. And the winner is uh, Jessica Sawchuk. Um, Jessica Sawchuk, S A W C H U K. Jessica, you are the winner. Um, yeah, congratulations. So all you have to do is send an email to the, the email address here, donate at signumu.org. Uh, say that you won and tell us which of the books that you want and we'll send you your prize. Congratulations and thank you so much uh, for your donation again as I thank all of you who uh, have donated here tonight. Um, we have raised almost $1,000 during class tonight alone. That's really awesome. Um, uh, really, really cool. Okay. And so now I will do the attendee drawing among all of our attendees. And yes, I am including uh, the people who are here in GoToWebinar and the people who are on Twitch. Uh, so let me just check here and see. Okay. Uh, I'm going to roll my percentile dice here. Okay. All right. Okay. And the winner is Thomas Joint. Thomas Joint, you are the winner of our attendee drawing tonight. Uh, so, uh, again, Thomas, same thing. Go ahead and send an email to that email address. Tell us which book you want, and we will give it to you. Tune in again next week because we're going to be doing attendee drawings again. The same thing, attendee drawing and a donor drawing uh, for class for next week uh, as well. Both both of the next two weeks' class, we're going to be doing that. Uh, again, I just I love to I love to give stuff away. I love to to just sort of celebrate. Um, you know, to, to celebrate you guys uh, and your faithfulness and your your contributions, uh, not just to um, uh, not just to uh, our our fundraising, uh, of course, which is awesome, uh, but also to our programs through your attendance and participation as well. Um, so these are the books just to remind you of uh, the books that you can choose from uh, those who uh, for those who won and um, and don't forget that everybody who has made a donation send an email uh, and uh, to donate at signumu.org mention the Mythgard Academy and we will enter you in our Mythgard Academy drawing uh, and again that that's not just for live attendees uh, all of you and I know that there are very many of you in fact uh, the people who listen uh, who watch uh, or listen to these sessions after the fact um, on YouTube or on one of our podcast feeds um, or through iTunes U um, all the different places uh, where our material is posted and distributed and of the people who uh, participate in the classes uh, in those ways after the fact outnumber the live attendees about 10 to 1 at least um, uh, in some cases uh, very much more so I, I want you to know that for all of you who are listening after the fact this applies to you too if you make a donation send us an email to donate at signumu.org and uh, we and, and mention the Mythgard Academy and we will enter you in the drawing uh, and send you an email to tell you if you've won. Um, so, uh, so yes. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, awesome. Thank you. Yes. And uh, the, the, the book will be signed by me and with the custom book plate, um, which includes a little a sort of a blurb that I, uh, um, that I wrote up either sort of reflecting on the Mythgard Academy class on that book or, or sort of just sort of talking about my own experiences and thoughts about the book and stuff. So, um, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's customized anyway. 
Thanks, everybody, for joining me. I really appreciate it. We'll be back again next week for more fun with Sir Lancelot. I will also have for next week uh, the uh, next reading assignment after this is the Book of Sir Gareth, which is almost as much fun as the Book of Sir Lancelot. Uh, the Book of Sir Gareth is also a favorite. Uh, um, that's a it's a cult classic in the in the in the whole scope of uh, Maori's work. So. We'll be moving on from Lancelot after next week, um, so I'll look forward to that too, but uh, I'll see you guys next week. Ooh, and I almost forgot, don't forget, um, we are coming up soon on the uh, the the deadline, the registration deadline for Middle Moot. If you're anywhere near Kansas City, don't forget next week and next Saturday, the 6th of October, I'm going to be in Kansas City, and I really look forward to meeting as many of you as I can. So if you're anywhere near Kansas City and can make it down, there's still time to register, even though we're only a week and a half away. Um, just go to uh, signumuniversity.org again just to show oops uh, the form timed out but that's okay uh, you can just go to our homepage uh, scroll down a little bit and there's our upcoming events and you can see here's the middle moot uh, page and you just go here and um uh, uh, and you can, there's the registration link right on there and everything. So uh, I certainly uh, want to recommend this very strongly. I was just talking with the Middlemoot uh, uh, organizer today and it's, uh, it's going to be great fun. So hope you can join us there. Anyway, thanks everybody. See you guys soon uh, next week, if not before. Thanks very much. Good night now. The Mythgard Academy has been offering in-depth discussions of awesome books and films since 2013, completely free to attend and free to download. If you've enjoyed our discussions and would like to help them continue, please consider donating at signumuniversity.org fund.